Hey everyone, in this video, I'm going to be breaking down Fables Volume 2, Animal Farm. In Volume 1, we met all the many human fables that lived in New York City. Well, in this volume, Snow White and Rose Red are going to take a trip up to the farm, and we are going to meet the many animal fables that live up there. We're going to meet characters like the rest of the Three Little Pigs. We're also going to see Goldilocks and the Three Bears. We're going to meet many characters from the Jungle Book, and many other animal characters beyond those, too. What's interesting in this volume is that the animals on the farm have grown to kind of resent the human fables that live in New York City, and now there is talks of a revolution and potentially a conflict between the two groups. So let's dive into it now. Fables Volume 2. Fables Volume 2, Animal Farm, written by Bill Willingham, art by Mark Buckingham. Fables Issue 6, Animal Farm, Chapter 1, Road Trip The name of this volume, Animal Farm, is in reference to the 1945 novel Animal Farm by George Orwell. That novel had a story of a group of farm animals who rebel against their human farmer, hoping to create a society where the animals can be equal, free, and happy. But in the end, the farm ends up in a bad state, worse than it was before their rebellion. The novel, even though it is about farm animals, was actually an allegory criticizing communism in Russia. And in many ways, this volume of fables has some similarities to George Orwell's Animal Farm. Snow White is going to head up to the farm for a week to where all the non-human fables live. She's going to see how things are going. She's also going to bring Rose Red with her, although this is a punishment for Rose Red. As part of her 200 hours of community service, Rose needs to do for that whole faking her death thing last volume. Snow tells Bigby that he's in charge of Fable Town in the city here while she is gone. As Snow and Rose leave, Bigby is supervising Flycatcher and Jack Horner, both of them doing community service janitorial work. Jack, he is doing community service work because of his part in the scheme with Rose's death last volume. Jack, he resents the fact that Rose Red's community service seems to involve basically going on vacation to the farm while he is stuck here pushing a broom. Flycatcher, he is doing community service work too because Bigby keeps catching him eating flies in public and each offense adds up over time. Flycatcher doesn't seem to mind the work, though. Snow White and Rose Red, they get in their truck and they begin driving up to the farm. They are bringing the pig Colin with them. Colin was the pig that has been avoiding going back to the farm for weeks, trying to stay in the city, because he says he is a city pig at heart. But Snow White is finally making sure he goes back to where he belongs. On the drive up to the farm, Snow, she's talking to her sister, Rose Red, and they're trying to work on their relationship and make amends. But Rose, she kind of basically complains and bickers the whole way. At one point, their truck overheats on their journey, so they have to pull over to the side of the road and wait for it to cool down. While they're pulled over on the side of the road, Rose asks how much longer till they get to the farm. Snow explains they've actually been on the farmland for the fables for the past 20 miles. She says we like to keep it remote up here, far away from prying Monday eyes. Our strongest distraction spells are woven into this land to prevent the Mondays from even getting curious about this area. Now even though Snow and Rose are technically on the farmland already, it is still a ways away till they get to the community center where the majority of the farm animals live. As Snow and Rose wait for the truck to cool down, Snow, she finds several shotgun shells and bullet casings on the side of the road. Snow thinks this is very strange because the Mondays should not be in this part of the woods. The spells should be keeping them out. So maybe these bullets belong to the farm fables. But it's weird, if there were any shots fired, they should have been heard by the fables living on the farm and they should have reported it back to Fable Town. Either way, eventually the car is cooled down, they get in the truck and they drive the rest of the way, and they pull into the farm's village. Rose Red is impressed with the scope and size of it. She comments, wow, this is sort of like old McDonald meets Walt Disney meets Munchkinland. Rose, 
She removes the rope leash around Colin the pig and lets Colin loose on the farm. Snow White, she wanders around. She wonders where all the farm animals are. Snow eventually finds her way over to the barn. Inside the barn, all the fables there are having a meeting. One of the three little pigs, named Dunn, is leading the meeting. Once Dunn spots Snow White is there, he quiets up, kind of suspiciously. Snow White, she asks if she's interrupting something. One of the animal fables, named Chicken Little, panics and yells, Run! Run away! It's a raid! The feds are here! I wasn't part of this! I was duped! I'll turn state's evidence! Snow White, she asks. So, um, uh, I take it this is a town meeting? If so, why is Dunn conducting it and not Wayland Smith? Wayland Smith is the fable that is supposed to be in charge of running the farm. He is the farm's administrator, and he is Snow White's counterpart up here. Wayland is a fable that comes from the Anglo-Saxon Germanic and Norse mythology. He's a master blacksmith and the creator of magic swords, armor, and rings, among other devices. Well, Wayland Smith is not here, and Don the Pig suspiciously explains it away. He says, oh, uh, we're simply having a town meeting. He motions that they postpone the rest of the meeting in order to make Snow feel welcome. Back at the city, a lot of the Fable Town residents are demanding to speak to Snow White, but Boy Blue has to turn them away and say she's up north at the farm. He tells them that if they have any emergencies to talk to Bigby. Boy Blue then slips into Snow White's office. He sees that Buffkin, the flying monkey, is drunk, and Buffkin also got the Forsworn Knight drunk too. Apparently, the last time the Forsworn Knight got drunk, it caused a bit of a mess. So who is this Forsworn Knight? Well, in medieval western myth, in, including the King Arthur mythos, there are a number of knights that are not known by their proper names but by adjectives, so the knight with two swords, the green knight, the savage knight, etc. In fables, the Forsworn Knight is one of these knights. His actual identity will be revealed later, but for now he's just a normal kind of looking human in a full suit of plate armor. We jump away from the city and go back down to the farm, to the home of the three little pigs. We see the three little pigs have a sign on their front yard showing that Bigby is not allowed at the farm. Inside their home, Snow White and Rose Red are having tea with the three pigs. Snow asks Dunn, what was that meeting about this afternoon? Dunn explains that since it is so close to Remembrance Day, they are talking about marching back into the homelands and fighting the adversary to get their homelands back. Snow White says that he sounds like a return activist, which is a name the fables use to refer to other fables that are arguing for war again with the adversary. Dunn says that he is in fact a return activist, and he is not ashamed to admit it, and there are hundreds of those at the farm that feel the same way. In fact, the majority of them feel this way. Snow asks how long have they felt like this, and Dunn says, ever since the beginning of living here on the farm. Snow, she can't believe that they're advocating for another war with the adversary, to throw their lives away on a senseless bid to retake their old lands. Posey the pig, one of the other three little pigs, explains, Well, unlike all of you down in the big city, we don't look human enough to blithely fit in amongst the Mundies, whereas you can travel this whole wide world if you ever mind to, but we're stuck forever and ever on this one patch of land. Dunn adds, as long as you insist on the laws keeping our true natures hidden from the Mundies, we can't set one foot outside of this prison camp for fear of a talking pig or a real-life giant would let the cat out of the bag, so to speak. Snow White thinks they are being ridiculous. This farm isn't a prison. It's beautiful here. It's a thriving community. And 90 cents out of every dollar the Fable Town government collects is spent right here on the farm. Posey and Dunn don't care. They say a nice prison is still a prison. Since it is getting late, Snow White and Rose Red start heading out to go to bed for the night. Before they leave for their room, though, Snow asks again, where is Wayland Smith? Don and Posey the pig say once again suspiciously, he left, resigned, suddenly.
Well, something is definitely going on up here on the farm. As Snow White and Rose Red leave, Don and Posey continue to talk. Posey wonders if Snow suspects them of anything. Don says, oh, Snow White definitely doesn't believe us, but she can't prove we're up to anything. Don then talks to Colin the pig, the pig that was living there in the city for a bit there. They ask if he succeeded in his mission in obtaining copies of the keys to the Woodland business offices. This was his mission that they forced him into. Colin, he didn't really do any of that mission when he was in the city. He was just enjoying life being a pig in the city. Colin, he tries to come up with some excuses why he failed. He says, no, I didn't get a chance to duplicate the key. Posey asks, okay, well, how many fables did you find who are sympathetic to our cause? Will one of them come through for us? Colin answers, um, well, you see, uh, Bigby kept me on a pretty short leash, so I wasn't actually able to do that much. Elsewhere, Snow White and Rose Red go to their guest bedroom that they will be staying in for the night. They will be sharing a bed in it. Rose finds this annoying she won her own room and bed, but Snow says that this bed is big, and it's not like they haven't shared a bed before. Snow asks Rose, Why did things go so wrong between the two of them? They used to be so close and loving towards each other. Rose Red, she is not interested in this conversation. She just wants to go to sleep, and she brushes off the question. Snow White, she goes to shut the curtains to their room for the night to keep the light out. And as she heads to the window, she looks outside, and she is shocked at what she sees. Someone has killed poor Colin the pig, and they have put Colin's head on a stake, and they have left it there as a message. Fables, Issue 7, Animal Farm, Chapter 2, The Guns of Fabletown. The decapitated head of Colin the pig is taken down off its stake. Snow White asks how this could have happened. Dunn the pig explains, I don't know, I went to bed early, right after you left. He must have gone out again after that. You know how Colin is, was. He was always sneaking out looking for adventures. Snow White, talking to Dunn, says, well, she wants an investigation. She's going to call Bigby up to the farm. Dunn says she will not, not unless she wants a riot. Dunn brings up the rules in the upstate Fable Town Charter that guarantees that Bigby Wolf will never show his face up here, ever. Bigby, back when he was the big bad wolf, would often terrorize a lot of the farm animals, so they actually made a specific rule about him in their charter that he is not allowed up here. Dunn, he also tells Snow that he is the duly elected administrator of the farm, following Waylon Smith's resignation and he will conduct the investigation himself, deputizing whomever he sees fit. Snow tells Dunn he can't conduct the investigation because he and Posey are the prime suspects. They lived with Colin. Snow, she then asks again, what happened to Wayland? Dunn says he quit. Dunn also goes on a rant. He says, you know what? It was an outrageous insult anyway that Waylon Smith, a human-looking fable, was left in charge of the farm. He was a constant reminder of how all of them, the city folk, look down upon us farm animals here and treat us like second-class citizens. Snow White says Dunn is being ridiculous. Wayland was chosen because he was the best man for the job. Dunn replies exactly, the best man, not the best pig, cow, goat, or dragon. Elsewhere on the farm, Rose Red is talking to Posey the pig. She asks if they found the rest of Colin's body yet. Posey answers no. Posey asks to speak to Rose Red in private, as Posey suspects that Rose might be sympathetic to their cause against the adversary and going to attack the homelands. While that conversation is happening, elsewhere we see Goldilocks is with Papa Bear, Mama Bear, and Baby Bear, or Boo Bear, from the famous Goldilocks and the Three Bears story. They are there also with the goblin known as Radcap. They are burying Colin's body. They were the ones responsible for Colin's death. Specifically, Goldilocks says she is one of the ringleaders in this operation here on the farm. 
Mama Bear asks Goldilocks, Was it really necessary to put Colin's head on display like that? On a stake for the whole village to see? Goldilocks, she says, It was hardly a stunt, and yes, mums, it was quite necessary. It symbolized that it is time for our revolution to come out of the shadows and begin in earnest. Now there's no turning back, and all the cowardly fence-sitters on the farm will finally have to choose sides, or suffer the consequences. Mama Bear comments to Goldilocks that she is human, she could choose to go down to the city if she liked, she's not stuck here like them. But Goldilocks answers, yes I could move away, but I choose to take my stand here with you. Your cause is my cause. Do you think I share your son's bed only because it happens to be just right? Baby Bear answers, No, it's because I'm hung like a... Goldilocks cuts off Baby Bear. It appears that Goldilocks and the bear have a sexual relationship. Goldilocks continues and explains why she sleeps with Baby Bear. She says, I do it because it's a vital and powerful political statement. It symbolizes the fact that we're all equal. There is no superior species, bear, human, or hedgehog. It can make no difference, even in our most intimate lifestyle choices, or we're all oppressors. While Goldilocks and the bears are all talking, another fable shows up. His name is Reynard the Fox. Reynard, he smelled Colin as the smell of freshly killed pork attracted him here. Reynard is not aligned with Goldilocks and their revolutionary cause. Reynard asks them why did they kill Colin? Wasn't Colin on their side? Goldilocks answers Colin was weak. He failed in his vital mission among the enemy. Those who aren't strong enough are no different from outright traitors to the cause. Goldilocks then points her gun to Reynard. She's gonna kill him as he's seen too much. Papa Bear stops Goldilocks though. He says if she fires, everyone will hear the shot. Reynard, he runs for his life in the meantime. Goldilocks is furious about this. She says, you let him get away. We gotta hunt him down before he can speak to the others. Posey the pig elsewhere is trying to win over an ally in Rose Red. He brings her to the cave beyond the farm. And that cave is full of tons of weapons that the farm fables have been building, collecting, and modifying for use by animals. They will use these weapons in their battle with the adversary. Back in the city, Big B and Little Boy Blue check in on the Forsworn Knight. The Forsworn Knight is still drunk from drinking with Buffkin earlier. The Knight, he begins telling a prophecy. He seems to be able to predict the future. The Knight says, There shall be unto them a great upheaval in the land. The children of the north shall maketh to smite the children of the south, and sister shall take up arms against sister. If you read between the lines, what the Forsworn Knight is saying is that the farm in the north is going to rise up against the city in the south. The Knight is also predicting that Snow White and Rose Red will be on opposite sides of the confrontation. Boy Blue, listening to this prophecy, says, Hmm. I think he's talking about Miss White and Miss Red fighting. Bigby, he replies, <laughs> If he is, he's still recycling old news. Those two have been at each other's throats for centuries. This boy is one crappy ass oracle. Back up at the farm, it is night time. The phone lines have been cut, and the keys to Snow White's truck are missing. Snow White and Rose Red are discussing the situation. Snow White, she thinks it's odd, but she still doesn't fully grasp how dangerous it is up here on the farm right now. Rose, though, she has seen the farm fable's weapons. She knows it is dire. Rose tells Snow that the truck keys are missing because they took them. Snow asks, why? What on earth for? Rose explains, because Colin's death wasn't the isolated act of a single lunatic. Because... They can't afford to let us leave or call for help. Open your eyes, Snow, for Christ's sake. Actually, forget I said that. You'll probably be safer the more you don't notice things. Do yourself a favor and continue playing the dullard for a few days. It should be ridiculously easy for you. 
Rose says she's going away and don't raise a fuss looking for her. Rose, she then walks outside and she joins some of the revolutionary farm animals that were trying to recruit her earlier. She tells them, let's go kids, I'm all yours. She right now has seemed to aligned herself with their cause. In the woods, Goldilocks, the three bears, and many other animals are searching for Reynard the fox. Goldilocks is giving military-style orders for the hunt for Reynard, telling this group to go there and that group to go this way. Posey the pig tells Goldilocks that Don the pig isn't happy about this situation. They wish that Goldilocks didn't insist on putting Colin's head on display. Goldilocks replies, Look, you and Don are in charge of the politics, and that's fine. But as long as Ma and Pa Bear have their ear of the farm's more predatory fable element, and I pull the strings of the bears, I'm the muscle end of our revolution. Posey the pig says that, well, their weapons aren't ready for the invasion of the homelands yet. Goldilocks reveals that she does not care about the adversary and retaking the homelands. She just wants to rule over both communities in Fable Town and the farm when the others return to reclaim the homelands. After the fighting, she will be in charge. We see more of the various animals searching for Reynard the fox. In the sky, there are birds. In the trees, there is Ka the snake and King Louie, an ape, both from the Jungle Book. There's also Bagheera, a panther, and Shere Khan, a tiger, also from the Jungle Book. Reynard the Fox has some close calls, but he manages to outsmart all of them and escape the forest. All over the farm, the Fables begin to arm themselves with guns and other weapons. We see one of the Fables, the old woman who lived in the shoe. Well, inside her big shoe there, she pulls out an assault rifle, and she tells all of her many children, Gather around, children. The glorious day has arrived at last. The call has gone out. Arm yourselves. And then all her little kids grab their little guns and they are ready for war. Snow White, alone in her guest room, is unsure what to do. Insanity is happening all over the farm. Reynard the Fox, after managing to escape the forest, has found his way over to Snow White's room and he appears at her window. He tells her that she needs to get out of here right away. He says, you gotta move it or lose it. There are still some fables that are loyal to her though. She needs to leave and not pack, so it looks like she will be coming back. Fables, Issue 8, Animal Farm, Chapter 3, The Pirates of Upstate New York. Rose Red arms herself and is ready to work with Don the Pig and the other revolutionary animals. Out in the forest, Goldilocks and her army have come to terms that Reynard the Fox has escaped and slipped past them. Goldilocks is not too worried, though. The only fables that can stop them now are down in the city, and all communication to the city has been cut. It's not like Reynard can run all the way over there. Papa Bear says that Reynard could send one of the flying fables to send a message to the city. Goldilocks says that she thought of that. She has summoned all the bird fables and ordered them to establish air superiority. Any flying fable that attempts to leave the farm will be taken out. Mama Bear, she doesn't like all this fighting, and she expresses to Goldilocks that Goldie is making the farm more like a prison than it was before. Elsewhere, Reynard the Fox and Snow White are on the run now. They are trying to hide out from the other farm fables. Reynard, he sees a flying hawk in the sky circling. He knows it is looking for them. Elsewhere in the forest, Cock Robin, one of the flying fables that is allied with Snow White, has arrived from the city. The other bigger birds swoop down and kill him, per the orders from Goldilocks. As Snow White and Reynard walk on, they discover a metal helmet with a gun mounted on top of it. Snow White is confused. What is this thing? Reynard explains it's a gun, specifically one that's been modified for use by non-human fables. In this case, I suspect it's intended to be a crew-served weapon system. Strap the thing on one of Mr. Tortoise for battlefield mobility, teamed up with one Mr. Hare for actual operation. As they discuss some more, the tiger Shere Khan closes in on them from behind. Reynard catches Shere Khan's scent 
and Reynard tells Snow, Listen up, your highness. You want to figure out what's going on? Then continue hiking over these hills, down through the valley of the big sleepers, and up to the hills beyond. Look for a remote cave there. You can't miss it. Reynard, he then breaks off and attacks Shere Khan, trying to buy Snow White some time. Shere Khan can't believe that Reynard would dare bite his tail. Shere Khan abandons attacking Snow White for now and turns his attention to fighting Reynard. And Snow White, she starts running. She climbs up a mountain. And when she gets to the top, she sees three sleeping giants, probably from tales such as Jack and the Beanstalk and the Big Friendly Giant. Well, they are sleeping over there in those hills. In the city, Little Boy Blue discovers that Cock Robin is dead, killed by a hawk. He warns Bigby that after the Forsworn Knight's prophecy about Snow and her sister, well, he tried calling the farm, but the phone line was down. So, he sent Cock Robin to discover what was going on and report back. Bigby asks, okay, well, how does he know that Cock Robin's dead? Boy Blue explains, because he was so worried, he had the Forest Witch put a Watching Ward spell on Cock Robin before he left, so Boy Blue could watch him and see what he sees. So, he knows for sure that Cock Robin is dead because he saw him get killed. Bigby, he is troubled by this. He's convinced that there is trouble on the farm. Bigby, he can't go to the farm himself due to the rules, but he will round up a posse and send them up to the farm to check out what is happening. Up at the farm, Snow White walks by the sleeping giants, and she begins climbing another rocky mountain. Shere Khan is right behind her. He is on her trail once again. He starts trying to claw at her. Shere Khan almost lost her trail, but Snow White stopped the pee a little while back and he picked it up again. Shere Khan is climbing the mountain and getting closer to Snow. Snow White, she nervously bonks him on the nose with that metal helmet with the gun she found earlier. This causes Shere Khan to fall down the mountain a little bit. He lands on some branches to break his fall. Shere Khan is angry now. He calls Snow White a bitch. He starts climbing the mountain once again. Snow, she has that helmet gun, and she tries to see if the gun on it is loaded. Shere Khan, he's nearing her once again. Snow, as Shere Khan is close to her, starts shooting the gun at him, and she hits Shere Khan in his shoulder. Shere Khan grabs the edge of the cliff. He's almost fallen off of it. He asks for mercy, but Snow White just calls him evil and she keeps firing the gun at him, shooting him multiple times, and then eventually, the tiger falls down the cliff to the ground and dies. After that harrowing confrontation, Snow White, she cries, and she sits down at the top there. She stays there for a little while, and eventually, she composes herself, and she continues on her journey. Snow White eventually finds the cave that Reynard the Fox told her about and she hears metal banging inside. She goes in to investigate, and she is surprised to find Waylon Smith there. Waylon was the previous administrator of the farm. He was the one that done the pig said, quit abruptly. Well, we see here he is being held prisoner. Snow asks Waylon, what are you doing here? Who did this? Why did you quit the farm without telling anyone? Waylon just seems confused, he asks. I quit, really? I can't imagine why I would do that, but if you say so. Suddenly, Snow White hears the voice of her sister, Rose Red, along with various fable allies of hers. Rose Red tells Snow White to back away from the prisoner. Rose Red is joined by Dunn, Posey, Goldilocks, the Three Bears, as well as the Walrus from Alice in Wonderland. Rose Red raises a gun to Snow's head and tells her, Snow White, by order of the ruling council of the Fables Revolutionary Authorities, I place you under arrest for crimes against Fable Kind. Fables Issue 9 Animal Farm Chapter 4 Warlord of the Flies Rose pointing the gun at Snow White tells her that she is under arrest for crimes against Fable Kind. Goldilocks argues that they should kill Snow right now, right here not arrest her, but Rose Red steps in front of her sister and says that they had a deal, she explains. That wasn't the deal, Goldilocks. My condition for joining you was that you let Snow White live at least long enough to stand trial. Goldilocks still wants to shoot Snow White, but 
Dunn and Posey Pig convince Goldilocks to back down. They say that they will chain Snow up here alongside Wayland and put her to work converting weapons for use by them. Later on, when they have more time, they can put Snow White on trial then. So with that, Snow White is chained down there beside Wayland. Snow asks Rose, how can she be involved in this? Rose explains, how can I not? The farm fable's grievances are authentic and long overdue for redress. The revolution was inevitable, Snow, and for once I plan to be on the right side of things. In the city, we see the posse that Bigby has organized is now making its way to the farm to check in on things. Little Boy Blue is driving, and along with him are Buffkin, Prince Charming, and Bluebeard. In the cave by the farm, Snow White is with Wayland, and they are alone in the cave, both still prisoners. She asks Wayland, how did he get in this situation? Wayland explains, there is not much to tell. I went to sleep one night in my bed in the farmhouse and woke up chained here, forced to convert these weapons. He further explains that they have placed a magical spell on the chain here he is tied to. It prevents him from escaping and compels him to do the work that they want him to do. They want him to convert these weapons for use by the farm animals. Once the weapons are done, they will most likely use them to invade the homelands. Wayland, even though he is compelled to build weapons for the farm animals, he does build a key to help Snow White escape from the chains she is shackled to. Snow White is confused. Wayland explains that the spell he is under because he is shackled to these chains only make it so he cannot try and escape, but it doesn't restrict him from setting Snow White free. Wayland, he laughs, he says, those amateur barnyard sorcerers didn't think to adjust the spell properly. So Wayland, using the key, frees Snow White from her shackles. Snow White says, wonderful. Now, how do I get you out of yours? Wayland, because he is compelled by the spell that is bound to him because of the shackles, well, he answers, I'm sorry, but I can't do anything by word or deed to help you set me free. Snow asks, well, fine, but, uh, do you have to actively prevent me from trying? Waylon answers, I don't think so. So Snow, she asks, okay, that's a start. Well, will this spell be broken if I get you out of your own chain? Wayland, he answers, I'm sorry, but I can't do anything by word or deed to help you set me free. Snow White, a little frustrated, says, all right. She thinks on it. She then comments, well, you've got to have something in this mess that I can use to pick the lock or cut the damn thing off of you. While Snow White is looking around that cave, in the forest outside the farm, Reynard the Fox is talking to some of the fables there that are still loyal to Snow White, not the revolutionary animals. He fills them in on the situation. There are all sorts of animals here, but one of the main allies appears to be this King Noble who is a lion. King Noble tells Reynard that he should go see if Snow White is still alive. If she is alive, well, We'll hang on, but if not, the best we can do is try to escape these lands during their midday rally. So, Reynard, he goes back to look for Snow White. The other animal revolutionaries that are allied to Goldilocks and Don the Pig are Bray Rabbit and Mr. Mole. They are traveling around the village and town and talking to other animals like Billy Goat Gruff and telling him to attend the big rally in the village center at noon. Reynard the Fox he eventually finds the remains of Shere Khan at the bottom of the mountain, dead. He is pleased that Snow White was able to take care of herself and is most likely still alive, still hanging on. Reynard, he starts making his way up the mountain, and he eventually finds Snow White still there in the cave, trying to get the shackles off of Wayland. Snow White, she's trying to smash them with tools, but is failing. She starts thinking that she's got to find some way to pick Waylon's lock. Reynard, who just arrived, asks Snow, Why don't you try this key lying here, or did you already try it? Snow White replies, Reynard, I was wondering when you'd show up. That key was the one that Wayland made to unfasten my shackles. It won't work on his. Reynard questions, Why not? The locks look the same. 
Snow White then asks Wayland. Um, well, I don't know. Wayland, do you think this could work on yours, too? Wayland, he starts sweating. He really wants Snow to use that damn key, but he can't tell her directly, he responds. I'm sorry, but I can't do anything by word or deed to help you set me free. Snow, she replies, oh my goodness, you sneaky bastard. Did you find a loophole to let you make your own escape key? Snow White, she tries the key on Wayland's shackles, and it indeed sets him free. Wayland, now free of the spell compelled on him, snarls at Snow White, saying, Took you long enough, you daft woman. Were you really determined to try every tool in this place before it occurred to you to try the key I left sitting right under your nose? Snow White, uh, she's sorry, but she says, All right, you're allowed one rude comment due to the obvious frustrations of being captive for so long, but don't push it. Snow, she then asks Waylon some questions before they leave. She asks how many weapons the farm fables have, and what sort of communications have they set up, and she wants to know why the giants sleep for so long. Wayland explains that they have guns for every single farm fable, but they haven't set up any real means of communications as they were so concentrated on the weapons. Wayland also mentions that the giants are under a spell to make them sleep, so that they don't have to try to explain away their existence to the outside world. Snow says she wants to try and wake them up. She also sends Reynard to the farm to try and gather up anyone still loyal to them. So Snow White starts making some moves. At the farm, Don the Pig is holding a meeting with all of the revolutionaries. He says, Friends, free fables, the time has come at last. Soon, as soon as we can arrange transportation, we'll be moving in on the New York City Fable Town. Once we control that, we'll begin open training for the invasion and liberation of our homelands. The time is now. Our destiny waits only for each of us to reach out and claim it. Snow White, she then arrives. She is waving a white flag, revealing herself to all the revolutionaries at their meeting. Goldilocks is ready to shoot Snow White. She asks if she has the okay. Rose Red says, Snow, Snow is holding a white flag for Christ's sake, hold your fire. Snow White walks over to the group of revolutionaries and says, Everyone, drop your guns and disperse. Your so-called revolution is over. The farm fables don't understand. Papa Bear says, but we've got you surrounded and outgunned. Snow White confidently says, you dumb bastards. I'm Snow White. I run Fable Town and I'm never outgunned. Kill the barn. She says this to a dragon named Clarathia or Clara for short. Clara is flying in the sky and she blasts some fire from her mouth down on the barn and it goes up in flames. We then see Clarathia with Wayland on its back in the air. Snow orders him to burn the town and anyone that tries to escape if anything happens to her. And then the three sleeping giants, now awake, surround the farm. They are allied to Snow White. With the dragon and the three sleeping giants now awake, all allied to Snow, Snow White has already won. There's no way the revolutionaries can overcome this. It is at that moment that Boy Blue, Bluebeard, Buffkin, and Prince Charming arrive as well. They are armed too, and they are here to rescue Snow White with their weapons. But Snow, seeing them, tells them, Relax, boys. We had some trouble, but it's all over now. My sister and the rest of these fools are under arrest. Snow White, she warns them, though, to watch out because... Goldilocks managed to escape. She should be around here somewhere, though. Hiding out atop a nearby building, Goldilocks is furious. She murmurs to herself, Intrusive bitch! Goldilocks, she aims her rifle, and she shoots Snow White right in the head, and Snow White goes down. Fables Issue 10, Animal Farm, Chapter 5 Twilight of the Dogs. This is the conclusion of Animal Farm. It has been six weeks since last issue, since Snow White got shot in the head. Snow White, she 
somehow still survived that. She wakes up now, six weeks after being in a coma. Bigby is there to greet her when she wakes. Bigby explains that they have all been taking shifts to look after her. King Cole's shift just ended this morning and now it's his turn. Snow asks what happened at the farm after she went down. Bigby explains to her. In the aftermath of Snow White being shot, a semblance of order was restored at the farm. Loyal Fables searched for Goldilocks but could not find her. However, they did find Goldilocks' weapon that she used to shoot Snow with, which she left behind. There was debate on what to do with all the treasonous fables that took part in the revolution. Also, what are they going to do now with the awakened dragon and the three giants? These are issues that will still have to be dealt with. Bigby did not want to burden Snow White with that much more information right now, so for now he tells her to rest. But two weeks later, Bigby visits Snow White again in the hospital, and he gives her another update. He tells her that the war trials up at the farm have started. We see at the farm, various farm fables are waiting in line for their sentencing by Prince Charming along with Bluebeard and Little Boy Blue. We see an example of how this process works. King Louis, the ape from the Jungle Book book, is in line for his sentencing. Bluebeard reads the charges against him. Actively aiding the revolutionaries, but not one of its ringleaders, he took part in the hunt for Snow White. Prince Charming asks King Louis, Do you dispute these charges or insist on a formal trial? King Louis answers, I guess not. Prince Charming, he then passes sentencing, he says, Then I sentence you to 20 years of hard labor, reduced to 5 years conditional on your good behavior. Now, 20 years or 5 years sounds like a lot, but... These fables basically live for hundreds of years potentially, so it's not that big a deal in the grand scheme of their lives. Posey the Pig is up next. Bluebeard reads the charges. Posey Pig, revolutionary ringleader, complicit in the murder of Colin Pig, the kidnapping and enslavement of Waylon Smith, and the attempted murder of Snow White. Those charges are pretty serious and pretty bad. Posey Pig, he tries to give some sort of explanation, but Prince Charming cuts him off, slams the gavel, and says, save it for later. Prince Charming then tells Posey Pig that he will be held over for a formal tribunal in contemplation of capital punishment. Posey Pig is then taken into custody. He will face some sort of tribunal or trial, and he may potentially be put to death. Over the next several months, various tribunals and trials and hearings are held, and various punishments have been doled out. And now, it has come to the day where it is time for the executions to take place up at the farm. Posy Pig was indeed executed, beheaded. Dun the Pig, another one of the ringleaders up at the farm, well, he has his head on the chopping block ready for chopping. Prince Charming pronounces, Don Pig, you also have been found guilty of high crimes against Fable Kind, for which the sentence is death. Jack, catch, carry out the sentence, and Don too is then killed. The next day after the executions, Snow White is finally allowed to leave the hospital. She is finally healed enough to return home to the Woodland Apartments. She has been in the hospital for months, and as Snow arrives, she asks Bigby if her sister Rose Red will also be executed, as even though she joined late, Rose Red was one of the revolutionary ringleaders too. Bigby, though, fills Snow White in. He says that Rose Red actually saved Snow White's life. It all came out in her hearing. The revolutionaries had just killed Colin, and after cutting you entirely off from Outside contact, it was obvious to Rose that, if not you, the two of you were next to be killed. It was unlikely you would have survived the night. So Rose Red convinced the revolutionaries that her sympathies were with them. She was reluctantly persuaded to join them, but only on the condition that they didn't outright murder you. So she only joined them to buy her and Snow White enough time for at least one of them to try to figure a way out of their predicament. 
Soros Red did not actually side with the revolutionaries. She only did so to save both of their lives. Once again, months later, now in the spring, Waylon Smith arrives at the Woodland Luxury Apartments as Snow White has summoned him. Snow White tells Waylon that he can no longer be the administrator of the farm. Waylon, he understands this. He's actually looking forward to moving back to the city. He hasn't lived in the city for over a hundred years. Snow White wants Wayland to also take up a new task. Up on the farm, Wayland was building adapted modern weapons for the Fables to fight the adversary. Snow White wants Wayland to continue that work. Wayland is a little confused. He thought Snow White didn't support the idea of war with the adversary again. Snow White explains that she did not support the Farm Fables revolution or their methods, but their idea to create modern weapons that can be used against the adversary is a good one, and they would be fools not to follow up on it. Waylon asks, so you want to invade the homelands? Snow answers, of course. Not today, though. Not this year, and probably not even this decade, but someday, yes. The adversary has us vastly outnumbered in raw troop strength, and he has a hundred witches or sorcerers to every one of ours. We need an advantage in weapon systems, so will you continue providing it to us? Only not chained up this time, of course. You'd be free to work at whatever pace suits you. Wayland says he will consider it. Wayland tells Snow, Rose Red rode down from the farm with me. She's been doing great work up there, but I think she's finally ready to see you face to face. She's waiting out in the truck in case you're not up to seeing her yet. Rose Red and Snow White eventually do talk. Their first face-to-face -face meeting since everything went down on the farm. They have a serious talk about their past resentments and everything that went down. They even discuss Rose Red seducing Prince Charming. In the end, though, Rose Red explains why she hates Snow White so much. She says... It is because Snow White is way more popular than her. Rose explains that that is the reason why Snow White is inexplicably alive. Rose says, Your skull and brains were all over the place and yet you got better. How is that even possible? Snow White answers, I don't know. Rose Red says, Unfortunately, I do. The Mondays adore you by the millions, by the hundreds of millions. They keep making their god-awful animated movies and writing their endless children's stories about you so you can't die. They'll never let you. So this is our first kind of explanation where we learn that the more popular a fable is, the harder it is for them to die. Snow White, she survived getting shot in the head. Rose Red, she continues and says, But who remembers me? Not one in a million of them. It used to be Snow White and Rose Red, and now it's just Snow White, period, all alone. No sister needed or desired, thank you very much. If it had been me who'd taken that bullet in the head, I'd be dead as a doornail. Snow White to this says, Alright, well, that's not her fault. Rose then talks about their childhood, how close they were, and they pledged they would be together forever. It was the two of them versus the world. But the moment Snow White met Prince Charming, she rode off with him, without so much as a backward glance. Snow White says, hey, it wasn't like that. I sent for you to come live with us. Rose turns from Snow and says, yeah, eventually. Snow White asks, and that was my great crime? It took me too long to send for you? That's why you seduced Prince Charming and ruined my marriage? All to punish me? Rose Red replies, bingo. Snow White says, well, fine then. You had your revenge long time ago. Why are your claws still out for me after all of these years? Rose Red explains, Because you're still the popular one, and I'm fed up of living in your shadows. Snow to this says, well, Okay, well then do something about it. And Rose replies, I already have. She explains that she's been working up at the farm. At first, just to finish her community service, but then she stayed because she was good at it and she liked it. She wants Snow now to formalize her position as administrator of the farm, replacing Wayland. Snow asks, well, why you? And Rose argues, why not me? Wayland is out and I can do the job. 
You run the city fable town and I run the farm, so at long last we're back to being equals again. I can handle that, can you? Eventually, Snow White decided that her sister Rose Red did in fact seem most qualified for the job. So, she was made the administrator of the farm in a formal ceremony. Rose Red's first official act of business was coming up with a solution to their dragon and giant problem. Neither the giants or the dragon wanted to go back to sleep for hundreds of years. But they are very big and hard to hide, and they require tons of food, and they are at risk of stripping the farm bare. The solution was an expensive one that required two years of discretionary budget of both the Fable Town and the farm, but it was necessary. Rose Red had a set of expensive transformation spells created, and the three giants were transformed into the three little pigs, replacing the original three little pigs. These pigs are Johnny, Lonnie, and Donnie. The Mondays, they need their three little pigs, and now they will have them. Marathia, the dragon, or Clara, was transformed into a raven. She will serve as Rose Red's enforcer. Despite being a raven, she was allowed to keep her dragon fire-breathing ability. After the ceremony making Rose the administrator of the farm, and after these initial acts of business were done, Snow White, she politely slipped away from the rest. She could no longer hold back all of her tears. She cried for all the killing and terror this past year at the farm. She cried for her sister that she lost for so many years, but at least perhaps found again. But most of all, she cried for the loss of a true wise friend called Colin the Pig. And with that, we end Volume 2 of Fables. Alright, so that was Volume 2 of Fables, and I thought this volume continued to be very strong. I thought the artwork was really great, and I thought it was really fun exploring the animal side of the world of Fables, and how their life works up on the farm. It was really fun seeing the three little pigs leading this revolution, and Goldilocks being the villain, and how she was manipulating the bears and all the other various animals, and leading them in their war effort. That was fun. I thought Snow White and Rose Red had some interesting moments this volume, exploring their resentments and their animosity towards one another. The overall story of this volume I thought was really compelling with this revolution up on the farm, and I really liked how it ended with Snow White stopping this revolution and sort of outsmarting and outmaneuvering everyone. Now, she gets shot in the head, which was a great twist, but yet she survives, and we are sort of now establishing the fact that Fables that are more popular are able to withstand death a little bit more than some of the other fables, so that was interesting too to see explored. So all in all, a very entertaining volume. I'm going to give this one a 9 out of 10. Thank you all for watching, and I'll be back next week with Volume 3.